Hello everyone and welcome back to the F2 show by Inside F2. Joining me this week to reflect on no- round number five, we have Inside F2's Jenny Craig and we also have returning to the podcast, Jim Kimberly. Uh, Jenny, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, Monaco, the jewel in the crown and uh, it was a, a chaotic weekend which we're, uh, we're going to discuss over the next half an hour, right? Yeah, it was pleasantly surprising. I think um, we definitely showed F1 up in being a lot more exciting. So, yeah, I was very, very happy with this weekend. A lot to report on, more than normal from Monaco. Yeah, the F1 race was a little bit disappointing, wasn't it? But we're not talking about that, we're talking about F2. And there was chaos left, right and centre, wasn't there, Jim? And uh, great to have you back on the podcast. It's been a little while, isn't it? This could be the the greatest return in uh, motorsports since Fernando Alonso to return to Formula 1. But, uh, no, it's, uh, yeah, it was, there was, there was so much to talk about, right? Yeah, you wanted the jewel in the crown for your jewel in the crown event, right? So Jim Kimberley right. is here, jewel Jim. That was it was a cracking <laughs> F two round, and uh, when you look at how F one was from the the record breaking Monaco race with the top ten finishers being the exact same as the top ten starters, you can look into F two, and there's nothing of that sort at all. I mean, we'll talk about it all, but even that one lap with Antonelli and Behrman, F one bound probably. And their overtakes was just far more entertainment than you had in 78 laps of Monaco. Or 76, I'll give them the lap one in Formula One at least. But depends if you like crashes. If you do, that was good. But otherwise, F2 is a place to look. 100%. There was action all over the place in F3 as well. It was a great weekend for, for the feeder series. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about Taylor Barnard, his first win in Formula 2 a little bit later in the show. We're going to be talking about Paul Aron, our new championship leader, the incredible consistency so far this season. But there is only one place to start, and that is obviously the feature race. Zach O'Sullivan winning his first race in Formula 2. What a way to do it. Um, I think it's fair to say, Jim, that it was outright goal hanging, right? He waited as long as he could um, to uh, for, the, for something to happen and it fell into his hands at exactly the right time, right? I saw him slip a five euro note to Dirksen earlier in the, the, re- <laughs> the week, you know, it was, it was, oh. he said in, in a quote after, it's like a one in a thousand chance, which there's a sort of, your, sort of odds you want in a casino around Monaco to, to win. But generally speaking, you don't bet it all and win big, but my God, did he win big. And I don't know if you guys saw the statistic that, or the the notes that were coming out of the the live feed that it was four seconds the gap between the VSC being called and him entering the pit lane. So if he had five seconds longer, he would have got a disqualification. Not he wouldn't have had a problem. It wasn't he would have had a disqualification because he wouldn't have had enough time to change his tires legally. So that's the sort of timing we had. But <laughs> highlight for me, I mean, great for Zach. But the highlight for me was listening to. Uh, Mr. Hajar's team radio afterwards. I mean, he's he's a radio bit of gold at the best of times, but this was just new levels of, I, I understand it, new levels of uh, Hajar. But terrific. What a way to, to end the race. Yeah, he was raging, wasn't he? We're going to come on to that very shortly. But yeah, Jenny, Zach O'Sullivan, I mean, luck, yes, but also to maintain his tyres for 40 laps. That's good going as well, right? So it's not it's not entirely luck. Obviously, a big part of it is luck, but uh, he did well to, to get yeah, up until that point, right? Yeah, and I think ART did the perfect strategy that they could have done for Monaco. They knew that they had nothing to lose from starting in P15 and that if they were going to stay out as long as they did, coming into the pits at the end, even without the virtual safety car actually worked out quite well for a few of the others. But yeah, they did well to even score points from 15th in Monaco, never mind win the race. At the start of the race, you're looking at ART, you're looking at Victor Victor Martin starting on the front row and you're thinking, you know, he's probably the one who's going to score points today for them if he can get off the line well. Uh, And uh, as you say, Zach O'Sullivan all the way down in 15th. And uh, here we are, Zach O'Sullivan, the race winner. Uh, Victor Martin's a little bit of a a disappointing, um, yeah, getaway. And uh, it really cost him, Jim, didn't it, for Victor Martin's? He needs to look at something that's happening with these these. Uh, starts at Monaco because look at him in the sprint race as well starts uh starts a weekend in the wall um with his uh start to sprint race and then basically ends up in 
the mid pack after being right at the front in the feature race to it, at Monaco of all places to do with Victor. It's just it's not really working out for him this season. And we look how far into it we are now. It's five rounds and he's sitting P20 in the standings. It's it's not where you'd expect him to be. It's not where he'd expect to be. Um, anything can happen in F2. He can turn it around, but he's got to start turning it around pretty quickly, I think. It's, it's, not, it's not the weekend he needed at a time when he needs to really start shining. Um, I feel for him and... I actually find this stat a little bit mad as well. And Zach, you consider that he shouldn't have had the win if we talk about a fair race. Uh, the ART and Premer at this point are, would have been podiumless. Yeah. Um, or Behrman, I think, would have got the podium if, if Zach if, didn't get it. So this would have been the first round. Ten races in for yeah. these powerhouse teams in F2 to not have scored a podium. It is just a bonkers year. I don't know if it's working with the new chassis or what, but... The drivers you'd expect to be at the top, the teams you'd expect to be at the top are not at the top, and it's creating a barnstorming championship. Absolutely. We mentioned that on the, on the podcast last week, that, you know, yeah, Prima and ART, the only teams without a podium. Prima still the only team without a podium, right, which is unbelievable when you, when you, when you think of it. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been an interesting start to the season, as you say, Jim. We've uh, Obviously, lots has gone on. We haven't had you on this season, so you just quickly, just give us a bit of a, your, your thoughts, really, on the season so far. Obviously, as you say, not the start of the season that Victor Martins would have hoped for. Oli Behrman, yeah, good result um, in, the, in, in the feature race. He's uh, finally got more points in in formula two uh than he has in formula one uh but uh yeah not not a great start to the season for either of them and Primer and art really struggling aren't they yeah it's it's good for a neutral perspective though because if we did have uh, like a bearman martin championship fight kind of like what we expected i guess a little bit of a porsche bestie round two but yeah. not those guys and I don't want to say it'd be boring, but it'd be predictable. And at this point, I could not tell you anything about how this season's going to pan out. I couldn't tell you who's going to win it. It could be one of the top, well, it's not even the top. It could be, could be one of the top 20 drivers I'm looking at Victor Martin and P20 still. It, it's just, it's sensational. But at a point where the F1 driver market is so unknown, and I was looking at some of the drivers who could lose their seat, especially in light of what's happened in Monaco and Ocon looking like he could be out of Alpine. And I don't know who's going to pick him up. And Ricardo might be on his way out. And Sonoda's fighting for his career, despite actually doing very good this year. Sargent looks like his days are numbered. Bottas, potentially Joe. The amount of seats are opening up and nobody's stepping up in F2 to think, hey, this seat's for me, going to be for me. Yeah. Apart from thus far, Hajar... Maloney, arguably, maybe it's not think about this weekend, although not all his fault. Um, and Paul Aaron, out of nowhere, rookie Aaron, just smashing it, showing Mercedes, hey, he shouldn't have dropped me. It's it's brilliant. It's it's fully entertaining, and it could have far-reaching consequences reaching into F1. 100%. We said it last week that, you know, for, for me, there, there's, there's been three standout drivers this year. I think, obviously, as you say, Isaac Hadjar has shown pace in every single race um, so far. He's been unlucky at points, particularly the first two or three rounds of the season, uh, but he's shown pace. Um, Zane Maloney, obviously, great start to the season. He's shown pace in almost every round so far uh, and race winning pace. And obviously, Paul Aron, the consistency. The, my only thing with Paul Aron is that he obviously hasn't shown any race winning pace yet, um, but he's still a rookie and there's still plenty of time for that. So, yeah, really interesting season. It's really starting to develop, isn't it? Um, let's talk about um, Isaac Hajar then, Jenny. Obviously, incredibly disappointed uh, that he uh, didn't win the feature race. Uh, it was on track to become. Uh, or join an illustrious group of only three drivers to win three feature races in a row with Charles Leclerc and Oscar Piastri. That's not bad company, but it just wasn't meant to be, was it? It was, uh, yeah, incredibly frustrating for him. And uh, I think he voiced that on the radio, didn't he? Yeah, I don't blame him, to be honest. He'd done everything right. Um, I don't know, maybe if the team could have told him to build a bit more of a gap. I think that's something that he was upset by. But... I don't think any of us could have predicted that O'Sullivan would have won it with was it three laps to go and a virtual safety car that was four seconds. None of us could have predicted that. So I don't think the team could have done any more than they did. I think it's all hypothetical, but he did do everything right. And since he's a championship contender, them 
seven points that he lost there could be very, very critical at the end of the year. He did it, calm down a little bit, and I did uh, I did speak to somebody who said they were speaking to him in the in the press conference after, and he had calm down notably but i have to say from what you what you saw with the the engineers the, the campus engineers and campus did such a good job in f2 and f3 at the moment as well um that they would just look so happy like mate you just essentially won the race everybody knows what happened i maybe they could have told him to extend the gap but they looked like they were pretty happy with the result so i have to say it's just one of those things that it's it's chaos, it's F2. And at some point, I'm sure if you look through Hajar's history, he would have benefited from something similar. Maybe not to race win, I don't know. I can't remember every race that he's done, but it's just the nature of the beast sometimes. It's how things work out. And Lando Norris won a race in Miami because of the timing of safety. It's just how motorsport is. Unlucky, that close to the end, heartbreaking, but he'll bounce back and he could win the championship at this rate. Definitely. It's, uh, yeah, as you said, he'll be frustrated because he could have been leading the championship uh, after this uh, weekend. But for me, what I took away from that was the mentality of Isaac Hajar to be that disappointed with mm. a P2 in Monaco. Um, that is, uh, yeah, some some real mentality, uh, well, winner's mentality, if you like. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, once he reflects on this weekend, he'll uh, come away from it thinking that it's, uh, yeah, good points in terms of the championship. As you say, Jim, he's well on his way uh, uh, to, uh, yeah, a championship campaign, putting the championship campaign together. Um, so, yeah, good for Isaac Hajar. Maybe not so good for Richard Vashaw, Jenny. I know you're a big fan of Richard Vashaw and uh, the poor guy. I, I don't know whether you've seen his Instagram post, uh, the uh, since since the uh, since the race, but clearly distraught. A once in a lifetime opportunity to win in Monaco taken away from him with an engine failure, and uh, yeah, poor guy, poor guy, right? But he did everything right, and I think he's another driver that would go away from this, and he can take some positive in that he looked like he probably would have won that. Yeah, Jim gutted for for Richard for sure. Really, really disappointing, right? You get a pole in Monaco, you think you, you're you on the podium, guaranteed. You think you're probably going to win. Um, yeah. To have, I think it was a drive shaft failure in the end that uh, took him out of contention. As you said, I just looked at his Instagram uh, while Jelly was talking. And it's a shot that you had on the uh, on the broadcast when he was just sitting on the stairs looking devastated, except for it's far right. more yeah. HD. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's a proper <laughs> heartbreaking thing. But you think... It, it, I don't know. And Richard probably, in his heart of hearts, probably knows F1's unlikely. Yeah. So Monaco is is the biggie to go with his Macau win to double up at some of the top circuits you can win in feeder series. Yeah. And to have it that close is going to be a really tough pill to swallow. And also, you think of Rashaw's luck, if he has any. I don't think he does. Yeah. Um, losing race wins in the past as well. Uh, it, was, it was at Austria with Sargent and... Yeah. Oh, yeah, the the guy, the guy does. Um, he bounced back uh, the next year, I think, wasn't it, with uh, with Austria? But the guy does seem to have all the bad luck he can possibly have, and Zach O'Sullivan, by comparison, had all of the luck that he didn't. So I don't know what you can say. It's uh, it's a very tough pill to swallow for sure. Who's probably looking at maybe one or two wins this year, and this was going to be a guaranteed one like jenny says maybe zach would have stolen it that it's it's gonna hurt a lot but there's a big gap before spain and hopefully he can come back feeling uh, a bit more upbeat Definitely. Hopefully he'll regroup, as you say, in the four-week gap and, uh, yeah, bounce back with uh, a strong performance in Barcelona. Um, we have a new championship leader, Paul Aron. Uh, another podium, the only driver to get a podium in every single round this season. Incredible consistency. Um, yeah, Jenny, um, you know, an, an, another good weekend for him, right? He just keeps on plugging away. Yeah, he's doing such a good job. I think he's doing similar to what, Paul Cher did last year in the sense he's not getting the race wins and yeah he's, he's he's so consistent I think he's like we said before we've always thought it was going to be the show, uh, not for sure Martin and Ben in this year but he's just he's doing so well but I I don't know if he'll have it over Hadjar if we're putting them two head to head I do think that Hadjar's a bit more rounded and like Jim said he's not had the experience of winning a race yet he's not had the pressure 
but he's he's doing so well and he's so consistent and that's what you need with the sprint week the sprint race format you need to be there in every race and he's doing it he is indeed jim did you have him down as a, a title contender at the start of the season i uh, i don't think many people did I've been saying it for years. Paul Aaron's guaranteed to be in court. No, I, no, I really didn't. And thanks for uh, jumping on the stat that I had in my head ready to go about the, the podiums as well, because oh, I was very proud when I spotted that earlier. But yeah, he's terrific. He's, um, he's taken it in his stride, which I think is most surprising. Uh, maybe it's not surprising. I don't know. It just seems a really cool, calm character. Like, yeah, this is where I'm meant to be. And I went on uh, well on the Wikipedia page earlier, and it's like Aaron, photo of Aaron from his Prima days, so somebody needs to update that, uh, saying Aaron is the current championship leader. I was like, what world are we living in when this is the case in his rookie year? And there's no slight on Aaron. I remember him pushing pretty hard in Frecker for the title, but he seems pretty, pretty outclassed in F3. Um, Mercedes not backing him anymore to potentially focus solely on Kimi Antonelli. I don't know if that puts fuel in his belly, but we're looking at Aaron and Hadjar with Campos and Hightech as the, the teams atop the championship at the moment. And that in itself is a surprise, let alone the drivers involved. And again, no slight on either Hadjar or Aaron. Not what I expected at all. And uh, current rates from Aaron as well. I don't know when it's going to stop. I don't think it is. It's not. Uh, it's not what could have been considered beginner's luck in this new chassis. And that's potentially the big thing that's benefiting him, that everyone's gone with this new chassis. It's just working for him. Because to get a podium in every round, across feature races and sprint races, most of them and feature races, that's just talent. That's that's not luck. That's not anything else. It's it's sensational. And if it wasn't for the Zach O'Sullivan uh, VSC, or not quite VSC pit stop, it would be four P2 finishes, not uh, another P3. Brilliant. Well done. Round of applause. You, you took the words out of my mouth talking about high tech there. I mean, how much credit do high tech deserve um, for, for, for this, Jim? I mean, you know, they've had a, a really strong start to the season. Obviously, last season, I think they were, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that they didn't have the best car in Formula 2. I think, I think that's fair to say. How much uh, credit do they deserve for the start of this season? They're doing something right, for sure. And... I'm finding it fascinating, as I suggested earlier, as you suggested earlier as well, the, the teams you kind of expect to see at the top of the championship aren't there. And if this is a case, and Delara should be introducing a new chassis every year so everybody can start from the same baseline. Because you do start to think, hold on a second, if it's the same car for five years and you are a Primer or a, an ART or something, you just hire all the mechanics that know the car inside out. And this is actually... The definition of a spec series at the moment everyone's trying to figure it out at the same rate there's no core advantage apart from potentially i've been an engineer or a mechanic for xyz years this is this is everyone starting from scratch we don't really get that very often and it's it's working out well um high tech yeah pat on the back to them guys are they're doing something right and it could be it could be that sort of thing that we saw uh, with Drogovic, that you combine the right team and the right driver together and it just works. It just explodes. That might be what's happening here. Paul's had his years with Prima and maybe it's just he's gone into high tech and he's uh, against Cordiel. And again, due respect to Cordiel, he's gone in as the lead driver, essentially. Maybe that's the thing. He needs to have that um, almost chest puffing up oh i'm the man around here and everyone puts uh, puts me first and that's the sort of thing he needs because it's something's working well this year be it high tech paul or what something's going really well and long may it continue for him everyone needs a bit of love don't they an arm around them saying that they're they're the bee's knees and uh yeah maybe that's the case for paul aaron this I think, year i think for richard assured us right now yeah yeah exactly oh don't don't take me back to paul richard for sure bless him um <laughs> a few other good performances jenny in the feature race ollie behrman uh moving up the uh the, the grid up to obviously p4 uh, and jam correa as well with p5 really good result for, for for both of those drivers who obviously started outside the top 10. Yeah, I think uh, the Vashore incident actually benefited them very well. Yeah. All the front runners were going slowly because they couldn't get, it's not the easiest track to pass on. So that benefited them very well. And I think Prima choosing to pit Behrman when they did 
actually was a really good decision and it would have got him a podium if it wasn't for the virtual safety car. Good results all round. Oh, Oli Behrman, he's had such a torrid start to the season. I'm uh, glad to see him finally get some some points on the board. Um, Jim, let's rewind to Saturday. Our sprint race winner, Taylor Barnard, with a great drive and uh, obviously from reverse grid pole. Um, yeah, obviously it was, uh, you know, great to see um, him and, 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 you know, the journey he's been on, uh, an amazing performance. And Monaco, he seems to be very good around Monaco, right? Paul Marie as well. He, uh, he seems to have a thing for Monaco. I was about to say, really long time listeners who actually remember me being on the podcast will know my thoughts about Formula E. And I've always said, if you want to win, get into Formula E. That's the yeah. championship you should get. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't, I don't know if it, if it helped a lot. The, the car is completely different, of course, uh, but some familiarity is is worked wonders because you, you've got to be a bit fortunate. To, you don't, you can't drive into a reverse grid pole, but once you got it, stick with it and. I don't remember the number of safety cars that he had to deal with, but there were multiple, I believe, that he had to survive that sort of restart. Thankfully for him, I'd imagine it wasn't going to be any red flag racing, especially to the, the Monaco. I mean, I don't want to be sound like the commentator and repeat them, but the Monaco uh, marshals are sensational because there would have been red flags at other tracks with some of the incidents they had to clear up, and they're getting these cars out of the way in what feels like a blink of an eye much to, to Taylor's uh, benefit, who, yeah, what a, what a sensational um, result for him. It's it's not been the easiest of championships for him so far. And uh, I suspect looking at his, his current CV and uh, the McLaren link that it's probably electric dreams for him rather than F1 right now. But you can't take away a Monaco win for any driver and, and he's got one. And AIX are... Flying high, we're getting to the point almost in like we've got in F1 right now that you don't have back markers like we've got in. There's no, there's no bottom teams in in F2 at the moment. Everyone's on a pretty even keel, and that's really good for the championship. It's amazing, isn't it? Obviously, AX went a long time, or PHM as they were, went a long time all the high, the entirety of last season without even scoring a point. Uh, and then since AX have taken over the team, uh, it seems to have t- turned into prime Red Bull, don't they? They've uh, yeah. <laughs> points last weekend. Josh Dirksen on the podium, uh, a win this weekend. Uh, and as you say, no, there's not really any back markers. Prime are the only team not to score a podium this year, and I'm sure that will change very soon. So every single team scoring a podium in a Formula Two season is just sensational, right? It's Prima's pathetic two drivers they've got. Who are these guys? They're never going to reach F1. I know, such back markers. I know, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, let's talk about them. Uh, let's move on to our feature, Rookie Watch. And Jim, I know uh, obviously you haven't been on the podcast in a little while. So we're just uh, on Rookie Watch, just having a look at some of those uh, rookies that, uh, yeah, perhaps haven't we haven't spoken about already. Obviously, we've already spoken about Zach O'Sullivan. We've already spoken about a few other rookies, Paul Aaron, who have done really well. But just highlighting some of those rookies we haven't touched on so far. Let's start with Kim. Kimi Antonelli. Um, for, for me, right, hear me out. Um, Kimi Antonelli is obviously getting a, a, a bit of a bit of stick online. I think that's fair to say um, about, you know, not quite living up to the expectations that he's, he's you know, coming to Formula 2, obviously linked with a Mercedes Formula 1 seat. Obviously, there's going to be pressure. But for me, Antonelli, every single round, he's, he's you know, he's scoring points. He's there or thereabouts. I think he's the fifth. He's in the top five um, average qualifiers, top average qualifiers, um, you know, so far in Formula 2 this season. Uh, and yes, he hasn't got any podiums or a, a win to his name. But for me, he's he's doing a good job. He's doing everything he needs to do. And second half of the season, there's no reason why he can't push on and start, you know, start uh, start winning races, Jim. No, he's right up there. I mean, I I feel when you have the attention that Kimi Antonelli is getting, uh, that there's an increased spotlight. To you know, sound very cliche. People are looking at his performances a lot more than they're looking at other rookies um, like Gabriel Bortoletto, like Zach O'Sullivan, like Colapinto. I'm just looking through the list now, like Pepe Marti. But Pepe Marti got a double podium in Bahrain and he's far down the championship order compared to Kimi Antonelli. Um, I think people have really got to consider the step up that he's made he's not a rookie that's come from f3 the f1 support weekend is new to him the car is new to him the attention is mainly new to him i think people in the feeder series world probably knew this guy's got something uh 
but the amount of attention, probably because of some driver who won seven odd world championships decided to leave he probably wouldn't have that amount of attention otherwise mercedes did something by bringing him up and announcing it really uh, late last year after the freck campaign that oh we're going to put him in tf2 of course that's going to put a lot of spotlight on him but then that's shone so much more intense because of what hamilton's decided to do and leave mercedes so now who's going to fill that seat i suspect if Mercedes came out and said, hey, we've signed uh, Alex Albon, for example, in March. Anthony wouldn't have that level of spotlight from the F1 world, the F2, the feeder series world, the inside F2 world, all these people who watch F2 and F3 religiously. We'd be watching him anyway and be thinking, wow, what a result this is. Yeah. But I, I don't want to sound rude, but I do feel that some of the people criticizing him aren't familiar with how feeder series works. Yeah. Uh, he's got, I'm looking at his results now, he's got three P4 finishes. So he's all right, no podiums. He's been a whisker away from it on three occasions. Mm -hmm. He's scoring points every round. He's not far away in the championship standings. It, it doesn't sound, uh, it sounds quite a lot when you look at 32 points as it is at the moment, but that could disappear in one weekend. He could be the championship leader after Barcelona, how F2 works. So, there's a lot of spotlight on him. I understand why. I'd say he's performing at the level I'd expect him to, if not a slightly above, um, with some feeder series knowledge that I've got. Uh, but also, I wanted to answer this as one of your previous questions uh, on, on Rookie Watch. Franco Colapinto, I don't know what happened to his uh, his tyres in the race or what. I'm fortunate to speak to him tomorrow on the feeder series podcast. I'm going to ask him because... He comes off the similar win, rookie, you know, rookie watch. Well done, Frank Carpenter, brilliant. And then you talk about how, how JM Correa and Behrman did well. Colapinto was almost instrumental in them doing so well because he held up the field in a truly train for most of the race, keeping people way, way behind after being perfectly fine in the sprint race. So I'm not sure what happened there. I don't know if it's a setup problem. I don't know if he had some sort of um, damage on his car. But yeah, Behrman did so well to do the on-track overtake on him and then do it on Antonelli as well to get essentially uh, a podium, if not for Zach O'Sullivan. So yeah, rookie watch, Colapinto. Got my eye on you, mate. What was that about? <laughs> no, I completely agree. Yeah, it was a, you mentioned the Oli uh, Oli Behrman and Antonelli battle as well. That was great, wasn't it? It was really cool watching that. And those two two drivers. I've watched it on replay. Fraser is so good. Like <laughs> just they were so close to hitting each other, and Rene Rosin must have been ready to get <laughs> get yeah. pretty angry on the team radio. Leave them to it, and even that alone would be one of these things. Should Antonelli be in in F one? Well, this is the no, racecraft. The defending, he's doing a Monaco. You lost the position, sure, but he didn't hit the wall. He didn't hit his teammate, and he did defend as well as he could on the tyres he had. Yeah, no, completely agree. Completely agree, and I echo what you say about Antonelli as well. He's for me where there, you know, where we would expect him to be for a driver who's just jumped up from Frecker. And if that's another driver, if that's Josh Dirksen that we're talking about with three P4s to his name uh, in the top five average qualifiers this season. Uh, everyone's raving about it. So I'm completely with you on that one. Um, Jenny, I want to move on. Uh, Gabriel Bortoletto in terms of rookie watch, uh, a really, you know, uh, a mint result for him in the, in the sprint races <laughs> is, uh, is uh, rookie, uh, his rookie, his engineer said. Um, and yeah, good, good performance by him. Um, and and yeah, are there any other rookies that stood out for you? Oh, um, obviously Aaron, but we've already touched on him. Can so I point out uh, Miata for one thing, by the way? And I know this is not exactly rookie watch, but I've got a rookie watch Miata in the tunnel and give her a shout out to Hajar in uh, missing him by millimeters. Um, Miata's, I don't know if he's surprising me or not, because I didn't expect uh, him to come in and, and walk the championship or anything like that. But it seems quite a roller coaster season, and I've out for him in, uh, in in Monaco. But yeah, I just wanted to bring up the what could have been an awful incident, and well done for Hajar uh, dodging him. But sorry, Jed, I don't know if you were going to say something about uh, Miata there as well. No, but I do think on Antonelli as well. I think a lot has to be said for how well he's doing against Behrman, mm. rather than comparing him against the field. The frame is clearly not up to where we all thought it would be. But he is performing so well against someone that we know is the new generation of F1. He 
did he proved it in his Ferrari and then he got he got that pole. But the Premier I don't think is up to being compared weirdly at the moment with the Campos and the high tech. I I don't think it should be a case of oh he's not won any races yet because another thing is if you compare it to how Petakoff did with this step. Petakoff had one of the most amazing Frecker was it just FREC at the time? Frecker. That level. He had one of the best seasons in that and I thought that he'd do a lot better. Fair enough, he was in a campus, but he made a lot more mistakes than Antonelli, which we've not really seen. So I think a lot's to be said for that, that even though the Premier isn't up to where it should be, I think he is. 100% completely agree. I think, you know, as you say, that's a really good comparison that Jean-Luigi, uh, Jean-Luca Petakoff, even, Jean-Luigi. Um, yeah, yeah, I've called him Giancarlo in the past, Fraser, don't worry. <laughs> um, stepped up, obviously, from Frecker, and, and he did struggle a little bit. He only lasted a few rounds in the Championship, didn't he? So, um, yeah. a lot to be said for Kimi Antonelli and how well he's doing. Um, let's move it on then. Uh, let's take a look at the Championship standings before we go. Paul Aaron leads the championship for the first time this season. He sits just two points ahead of Isaac Hadjar. Zay Maloney moves down to P3 in the standings after only one point this weekend. Dennis Hauger secured his 12th podium in Formula 2. He sits just ahead of Bortoletto and Antonelli. Feature race winner Zach O'Sullivan catapults up the standings to P7 after he became the 50th winner in Formula 2 history. Bit of an anonymous weekend for Kush Miney. He'll be hoping for better next time out. He sits P9, just ahead of Enzo Fittipaldi, who rounds out the top 10. And the team standings? Campos sit top of the team standings on 104 points, nine points clear of high tech. Some good points this weekend for MP Motorsport. They sit third ahead of Rodin and Invicta. A better weekend for Prima and ART. They sit sixth and seventh in the standings. And despite a win for AIX this weekend, they still round out the bottom of the standings. Okay, that's all we've got time for today. A massive thanks to Jim and for Jenny for joining us on today's show. If you enjoyed the show, as always, make sure you give it a like, subscribe for more Formula 2 content. We've got lots coming your way between now and Barcelona. And get involved in the conversation as well. Let us know what your thoughts are in the comments. Uh, we love hearing from you. But from me, Fraser Ford, Donald Vassir at Inside F2. We'll see you next time.